It's my, my privilege now to, to ask Mark Lipsitch, Professor Mark Lipsitch, to give the first keynote presentation. Um, so Mark is a professor of epidemiology at the Harvard School, for, School of Public Health within the departments of epidemiology and the department of immunology and infectious disease. Um, his research concerns the effect of naturally acquired host immunity, vaccine-induced immunity and other public health interventions on the population biology of pa populations uh, of pathogens and the consequences of changing pathogen populations for human health. Um, his presentation uh, today is entitled, unless he's changed it, um, Sources and Consequences and Use of Genomic Diversity in Strep Pneumonia. Thanks Thank very much, Mark. This will not work. Thanks uh, very much, John, and thanks to all of the organizers for the opportunity to present here. Um, uh, that is my title. Uh, I may, may have said genetic or antigenic. It's mostly antigenic, a little bit of genetic. Um, and I'm going to talk about a number of topics that might or might not seem like public health microbiology, especially uh, applied public health and bioinformatics. Uh, I'll try to make the case for the relevance, and you can judge for yourself. Um, but I think that antigenic diversity is a, an important concern for public health microbiology. Um, and, and in part, that's true because the, exa the existing vaccines that we've had for many years uh, focus uh, on on antigens that are nicely conserved, and you can sort of read MMR and DPT uh, there on those vials. Those are the ones that we've had for a long time. So those are the easy vaccines, and not to say that they were easy, but perhaps easier. And now the hard ones uh, remain. And techniques like reverse vaccinology, which depends on understanding the level of diversity, uh, genetic diversity of particular antigens within the bacterial or pathogen population, depend on understanding uh, uh, on antigenic diversity, uh, or hopefully on the lack thereof. And the problem that I'm going to focus on, I won't talk about uh, reverse vaccinology, although uh, it's an interesting topic in itself, but the topic that I'll focus more on is, the, is that of sort of the flip side, which is serotype or strain replacement. Um, and in certainly malaria and pneumococcal disease, uh, and uh, those have been, that problem has been a concern and it's actually been a concern in a number of other ones uh, as well, although not always realized. Um, and that's really how I got into this uh, t general topic, uh, was to try to understand and maybe predict what would happen with serotype replacement. Um, so uh, serotype replacement is the outgrowth of non-targeted serotypes uh, for strep pneumonia that's a carried organism that can happen both in carriage and uh, also perhaps in disease, when a serotype-specific vaccine is deployed. So you vaccinate against some problem and you get uh, a diminution of that problem accompanied by an increase of another problem. The increase may be smaller or larger or equal uh, than, the, than the decrease. Um, and fortunately, in most cases with strep pneumonia, it's been smaller, uh, at least in disease. But uh, that was a concern when the vaccines came out. Uh, and I, I got interested in this uh, by writing a paper in 1997 about what the, the consequences of such a vaccine might be. Um, and certainly that uh, the prediction of serotype replacement has occurred. Um, the top graph there shows uh, invasive disease isolates from a CDC study uh, published a few years ago uh, with the uh, advent of pneumococcal conjugate vaccine, uh, the seven-valent one, you see the red curve declining vaccine-type disease, and in the green and blue, uh, increasing disease from other types not included in that vaccine, some of which are now included in the newer vaccines uh, for the same thing, uh, for the same organism. But still with 90 serotypes uh, and more, we are not covering everything. The lower figure uh, shows uh, nasopharyngeal carriage, where you see 
uh, an almost complete replacement of the nasopharyngeal ca carriage population uh, with non-vaccine types uh, in uh, instead of vaccine types. Um, and that was a study that I, I was involved in uh, with the Massachusetts Spark Group uh, that's been monitoring changes in the carriage population over uh, more than a decade. So trying to study serotype replacement and uh, predict how it might work is a very interesting topic, but to believe your own models, you would probably like to have a clear idea of what maintains the diversity that was there in the first place. And that's really the, the basis uh, from which uh, all the work I'm talking about today uh, began. So the the explanations that people give for the, the presence of genetic diversity uh, in a population are neutral variation, uh, balance between mutation and genetic drift, so there's no selective process at all going on, or uh, uh, also uh, not mutually exclusive is the, the idea of negative frequency dependent selection, which is basically the idea that the more common something is, uh, the more common a variant is, the more people are immune to that variant, and therefore the uh, greater the advantage to being some other rare variant, and that tends to preserve uh, diversity within the population, but it has to outweigh directional selection, meaning the selection uh, to, to uh, sort of optimize the function of whatever the uh, antigen is. And we often, in vaccine world, think of antigens as things that are made to be vaccinated against. But of course, they also have functions for the organism, uh, and those functions can be optimized and uh, subject to selection um, for their function, their protective role usually, uh, as well as for their role as a target. And then the third uh, class of explanations is the idea of host-specific adaptation uh, and linkage to other loci maintained by epistasis. That's a mouthful, uh, which I will uh, refer back to a little bit later. Uh, but that's an idea that Sinatra Gupta, I think, first proposed, and, and Martin Maiden and others have uh, applied in the bacterial context. So in the, in the pneumococcus, we have uh, three arms that we know of, of acquired immunity. Um, and we have diversity that may be related to each of those arms of immunity. So I'm really focusing on this second explanation, uh, and I'll get to the other two. Uh, in a little while, uh, but, but I'm going to really focus most of the discussion on this second explanation. So there's antibody that we produce uh, naturally to the capsule polysaccharide, which I'll explain more about in a moment. And then uh, that's the sugar coating on the outside of the bug. And then there are also many protein uh, targets that we make both antibodies and CD4 positive T cells uh, as arms of our adaptive uh, immune response. So what I want to do today is talk about the causes and consequences of antigenic diversity at the capsule. Uh, then the second, uh, try to apply the same thing to the proteins. And the first is a, I hope, fairly complete story. Uh, we think it's complete. Uh, maybe you'll find holes in it. And I'd love to hear about them. Um, the second is very much work in progress. And then the third is a sort of different approach altogether about an application of using uh, antigenic diversity for gene discovery. So I'll start with the capsule. So the capsule uh, shown here on an electron micrograph is the sugar coating outside the cell. It's encoded by about a 10 to 20 kilobase locus called the CPS locus uh, with a variable number of biosynthetic uh, enzymes. <clears throat> there are about 92 or so, maybe 94 now, uh, different serotypes uh, uh, distinguished by antibody reactivity. And this capsule, or which determines the serotype, affects almost every property of the pneumococcus host interaction that we've been able to think to measure, uh, as I'll describe. If you look in a pneumococcal population, there's a remarkable diversity of capsular serotypes. This is a, a population from Kenya uh, studied by Osman Abdullahi uh, in his PhD thesis, um, and you see a, a, a few common serotypes and uh, a number of uh, rarer serotypes. And if you compare then studies like this between different regions and different times uh, over the last few decades, uh, <clears throat> on average about seven of the top 10 serotypes will be conserved between any two sites. 
So there's something natural about this. It's not that we throw down the serotypes and this one's good here and this one's good there and it's, there's no relationship. Uh, the top 10 uh, are, are relatively conserved when you compare uh, different, different carriage studies. So what we thought was that this really makes no sense. Um, and the reason why it arguably makes no sense uh, is shown on this diagram, and I'm sorry for the, the busyness, uh, but I'll, I'll walk through it. This was from Dan Weinberger's uh, uh, work when he was in our lab, but it reflects work of, of a number of people. Um, and so there are some serotypes, like one and four and five, for the pneumococcal jocks out there, uh, that are basically should be losers. And they are losers in the sense that they tend to be at low prevalence. I can't seem to, can't seem to. They tend to be at low prevalence. Um, but what we have seen through uh, mostly in vitro studies, uh, as well as um, some competition experiments in mice that I'll show in a minute, are that these are losers in a lot of ways. They have relatively little negative charge on their capsules. Uh, they, they have particular motifs in their, in their polysaccharide structure, so there seems to be a biochemical basis of this. Um, they produce less polysaccharide, or at least a less rigid polysaccharide, uh, and therefore appear less encapsulated on uh, electron micrography, uh, sorry, light, on light microscopy. Um, they are easily cleared by phagocytes uh, and have a short duration of carriage in humans. Uh, so the clearance by phagocytes is, is a, an in vitro observation and the duration is an epidemiologic observation. They compete poorly in the nose of a mouse. They have low acquisition rates measured epidemiologically. And all of that combines, we think, to cause low prevalence, which feeds back to low acquisition rate because of transmission. And then there are other types that have exactly the opposite. They're, they're the big, robust capsules, and they seem to be good at just about everything. So just to give some examples, I'm not going to go through the data supporting all of that, uh, but because all of it except this part is published. Um, but the, if you compete uh, variants of the uh, pneumococcal capsule uh, that, that differ only at the pneumococcal capsule uh, in the nose of a mouse, um, you see that actually this, this graph I happen to know, I misquoted, this is from uh, not isogenic capsule variants, but we did the same thing with capsule variants uh, that were on isogenic strains, found the same thing. What you see is that certain, certain serotypes reliably colonize better, uh, the 19s and the 23Fs. Uh, 6B is a sort of intermediate case, and then there are some less successful serotypes, and that's consistent across a range of capsule, uh, of strain genetic backgrounds, mouse genetic backgrounds, mouse conditions, uh, in terms of their immune uh, competence uh, of various sorts and uh, other, other properties. So these uh, winners in the human population are winners in the mice as well, even when you remove all background effects. Um, another consistent pattern is the relation between prevalence, which is sort of the ultimate uh, fitness measure in humans, and their ability to survive on a plate when you expose them to human neutrophils uh, and those that survive better. Uh, tend to be the higher prevalence serotypes. So if everything about some serotypes is uh, either good or bad, you would expect the good ones to outcompete the bad ones, uh, according to basic ecological theory. But uh, as I said earlier, one way that could be counteracted is by the influence of uh, strain-specific, or in this case, serotype-specific immunity. And we documented that such immunity exists. Uh, we were able to document it clearly for the three serotypes in uh, blue. What these numbers show, and you may not be able to read the numbers, but what the squares show is the reduction in the hazard or rate of acquiring a given serotype among toddlers who had previously been seen to carry that serotype. So the strongest one is, uh, is that you have only an 8%, you're only 8% as likely to acquire type 14 as uh, if you've had type 14 before as if you haven't. Uh, you're about 50% as likely with straight type 6A and about 50% as likely with type 23F. Um, the other, other uh, um, relationships are similar, mostly protective, but not always statistically significant. 
And other studies have shown 14, which is by far our strongest effect, uh, to be protective. Nobody else has found these other two serotypes, but it seems to be a general pattern that the, that the, serotype, that the immunity exists, but except perhaps for type 14, it's weak, uh, the serotype-specific immunity. <clears throat> Working with the Rick Malley's lab at Children's Hospital, we've also been spent a long time uh, investigating the T-cell arm of immunity, which I'll come back to uh, in a little while. Um, but, but just to give you a taste of how it works, if you expose a mouse either to a killed preparation, the whole cell vaccine, uh, uh, which is a killed unencapsulated pneumococcus, or to colonization with a live pneumococcus, uh, which is then cleared by antibiotics before challenge, it turns out that what happens to those mice is that they're not protected against acquiring uh, the uh, pneumococcus uh, that they're exposed to, but they clear it much faster uh, than a naive mouse. Um, on the order of about four days in a, in a mouse, uh, we don't seem to do that in humans as quickly, but as I'll show you, we have a similar thing going on in humans, we think. Um, and this is an immunity that is antibody independent, antigen specific, but depends on uh, CD4 positive T cells TH, of the TH17 uh, category. We haven't proven uh, as much about the relevance of this in humans. The, the Mali lab has done some work and is in clinical trials with a, a T cell uh, stimulating vaccine uh, now, so we'll know more about the role in humans uh, soon. But if you use age as a proxy for exposure to, uh, to pneumococcal carriage, what we find is that children, young children, and this is again in Kenya, young children uh, who uh, haven't had much exposure tend to be colonized for on the order of 100 or 200 days to some serotypes, whereas uh, older children reliably clear carriage within uh, about a month. Um, and it doesn't matter what serotype it is, the, the differences between serotypes sort of get erased once you have immunologic memory. So the advantage of being a type, uh, type 19F or 6A is uh, very pronounced when you're very young. And then as you age, which we believe is a proxy for exposure and development of this immune response, uh, you get better able to clear everything. And that disproportionately harms the, the highly fit long duration serotypes because they had the biggest advantage to start with. And that advantage is sort of flattened by the, the presence of the immune response. So to summarize what we think we know about immunity, there is weak serotype-specific immunity uh, that provides an advantage for real, rare types and thereby balances the differences in fitness, uh, offsetting the, the natural advantage of the, of the thicker capsuled types. And then there's this acquired non-serotype-specific immunity, um, which reduces duration, and it does so in a way that disproportionately harms the fitness of the high fitness types. And so it squashes together the fitness values of the different serotypes and means that in uh, everyone except the most naive hosts, they are actually more equal than they, were, uh, than they would appear to be uh, in vitro or in a naive host. So this has been a long-standing interest. And what we then did was to try to combine all this information uh, in a mathematical transmission model, computational transmission model, uh, that tries to put together these different forms of immunity. And what we found was that uh, if you don't have any serotype-specific immunity, this, that's this sigma, uh, if you don't have any serotype-specific immunity, you get a very high preponderance of the most common type. This is a log scale frequency of the different types ag plotted against their, their rank in the population. So you get a lot of the most common type and very little of the other types. But that if you combine a realistic level of uh, type-specific immunity, about a 30% average reduction in acquiring a type if you've seen it before, with uh, the sort of flattening immunity uh, that reduces duration, especially of the most common types, uh, according to realistic parameters, then you get, you're able to reproduce uh, very nicely the uh, rank frequency distribution, which is a way of summarizing the amount of diversity. So the flatter this, this line is, or this curve is, the more, uh, the more even 
and the more diverse the population is. So the, the level of diversity is captured by a model that combines those two types of immunity, although neither alone will do it. And that model also reproduces some other patterns uh, that are seen in, in, uh, in the pneumococcus, such as increased diversity with age, which you can see on the right-hand side where there's a more even distribution uh, uh, in the older individuals in the modeled population, a stability of the rank order, uh, which uh, is what we saw, that certain types are almost always more common, a decrease in the carriage duration with age, uh, reasonable frequencies of co-colonizations with different types. Uh, one thing we didn't expect to see but did see was epidemics of, of the rare serotypes. So the really rare ones are not uh, even around some of the time, and then they have these sort of decadal uh, scale epidemics uh, as, as susceptibility to them builds up in the population. Uh, and of course, serotype replacement after vaccination. And uh, just to, to make the connection to uh, public health microbiology, many of these were, uh, these are obtained from public health surveillance data. What we're doing right now is trying to adapt this model to predict what will happen as different kinds of vaccines uh, are used in the population in different ways, either to, uh, either as we maybe uh, pull back on the use of uh, some of the conjugate vaccines by trying to use lower dosing, fewer doses, uh, maybe save some money, um, or as uh, we try to replace the uh, replace or supplement conjugate vaccines with vaccines that are uh, like the whole cell vaccine that are supposed to be serotype non-specific. So that's our current pro a current project. Um, but one of the things we figured out in the process of doing this that's of more basic science interest, I think, is that when we fit the model to the data, we fit it to the pre-vaccine uh, data on frequency, so you can't read this, but each, each uh, uh, place along the curve is a frequent is a serotype, and the the height is the frequency. So we fit the uh, sort of long-tailed uh, frequency distribution of different serotypes with the model, and then we implemented the vaccine in the model, the the conjugate vaccine, and fit it to data from after the vaccine. And what we found was that there was a systematic uh, tendency for the serot serotypes that are related to other serotypes that are within serogroups, and you can tell that because they have letters after them. So that's a serogroup 19, serotype 19A. That those serogroup, serotypes that were not in the vaccine but were related to types in the vaccine were the ones that increased more than we would expect in a simple model where every serotype is different. And so what we think this might show is evidence that naturally we have some cross immunity but within a serogroup uh, that is, has not been previously uh, known, although it's been suspected, um, and, and that having been exposed to one member of a serogroup may modestly protect you against other members of that serogroup. And at the same time, just recently, uh, Nick Croucher uh, in our uh, group published a uh, paper, uh, which we called the zombie because it He's no longer in our group, and <laughs> it's been hanging around for a long time, thanks not to Nick, but to some of his uh, more senior colleagues, uh, who I won't name, but one of them is speaking to you right now. Uh, <clears throat> the zombie paper showed that, uh, that one of the th remarkable things is when you look at the whole genome sequences of, uh, of pneumococci, they tend to switch capsular types within a sero group uh, more, way more than you would expect by chance. Uh, and we saw that from surveillance data, but it's even more pronounced when you look into phylogenies and uh, really can see all the capsule switch events, some of which are silent from, from pure surveillance data. Um, and we tried to test various hypotheses for why this might be, both, both genetic hypotheses that it was just easier to get uh, capsules within the same serial group and, and uh, selective hypotheses and that, that would be uh, visible in vitro, for example. And none of them seem to explain this, uh, this tendency to switch within serogroups. So as a sort of diagnosis of exclusion, I think the, the most 
reasonable remaining hypothesis is the idea uh, that's this uh, idea of Sinatra Gupta's and, and others that I mentioned before that there is cross immunity within a serogroup group and that essentially the backgrounds become adapted to being a certain of a certain serogroup. group um, and when you when they switch it becomes uh, more useful to have another serotype of the same serogroup group uh, than to have a completely different one. So we can't prove that. As I say, it's really sort of the last standing hypothesis, um, but it's, it's at least suggestive. I want to switch now to talk about protein antigens. And, to talk, uh, and there we're really talking about two different arms of the acquired immune system, the, uh, the antibody arm and the CD4 positive T cell arm. Uh, and again, this is all in, uh, much of this is in progress. Some of it's complete, but some of it's in progress. So it's not just the capsule that's variable. The whole uh, pneumococcal genome varies. Uh, and this is the, the core genome tree um, from, a, uh, from a paper by Nick Croucher uh, and colleagues. And it's, uh, there's a lot of variation at, at many loci. But that variation is particularly focused uh, on the uh, surface proteins and on uh, particularly things that we think are probably antigens, although we have little direct evidence of their importance as, anti as natural antigens. So this heat map here shows where the recombination uh, has, has occurred, which brings in large blocks of variation. And the hotspots for recombination uh, are almost perfectly aligned with known occasionally mobile genetic elements, but also with known or suspected antigenic surface proteins. So this hypothesis is kind of uh, the standard thing that surface proteins want to vary because it helps them escape the immune system. Um, but what we wondered was whether there is really a trade-off as there is in the capsule. You want a good capsule, but you also want a rare capsule. But the if, the, if a capsule is good, it becomes common. And so there's a trade-off between being good uh, and having a good one and having a rare one. Is a similar thing going on in the proteins? And so we, uh, we asked that question, and, and this was, uh, I'm embarrassed to present a, a, a result relying on, I think, 31 genomes from another era. Uh, <laughs> Um, but that's how many genomes we used, or maybe it was 37, a small number of genomes. Um, but nonetheless, we were able to, uh, to look at them, and we'll, we'll repeat it with a larger set uh, shortly. But we were able to look at the question, uh, is there greater diversity, uh, uh, sorry, is there a greater evidence of diversifying selection uh, at antigenic loci than at non-antigenic loci? And for antigens that were where humans are known to have antibodies uh, to these loci, the answer was very clearly yes. There aren't very many of those loci, but there are. But they tend to be under uh, diversifying selection. Uh, but for T cell antigens, there was no such uh, enrichment. Uh, they were just like the background. And another, uh, this is another look at uh, the same thing using DNDS. Uh, greater than one as a measure. And in this measure, we were able to look at the codon level and notice that in the antibody antigens, the targets of, of antibodies, the epitope regions, as, as others had mapped, were much more enriched for uh, diversifying selection uh, or patterns consistent with diversifying selection than the non-epitopes. So that's what you would expect from the sort of standard story of uh, you want to diversify uh, your surface proteins <clears throat> to evade immunity. So, but, but that left the question of why they weren't trying to escape from the, uh, the why the T cell antigens weren't showing uh, much signal at all um, of such, such a thing. And so that was when we went uh, again into an experimental system and a very artificial system in which we, uh, we took mice they can only see, whose CD4 cells can only see one peptide, and it's a peptide of ovalbumin, so they've never seen it before. <clears throat> and we challenged these mice with a mix. We immunized them with that peptide so that their whole T cell, CD4 T cell repertoire was focused on this one immune response. And then we, immuno then we challenged them with a mix of the, 
uh, of pneumococci bearing that antigen and lacking that antigen, that fake antigen, that artificial antigen, and asked whether there was an enrichment over time, an escape of the antigen lacking cells, uh, pneumococci, compared to the, uh, to the antigen bearing ones, as you would expect if it helped them to, uh, to es escape immunity. And the answer was no. So if, uh, over three days, uh, the ratio of, of um, antigen containing cells uh, to antigen, uh, sorry, antigen lacking cells to antigen containing cells uh, stayed constant um, and the modest uh, enrichment here uh, was not statistically significant and, uh, and, and more importantly was modest. Um, so there's maybe a hint of a, uh, an advantage to escaping immunity like that, but, uh, but very little evidence of that. And that turns out to be consistent with how we think that the antigen-specific immunity works, that it has to have the antigen there to trigger it, but once the immune response is triggered, the neutrophils that carry out the, the murder, uh, the, the T cells orchestrate the murder, uh, they're the bosses, but the neutrophils do the killing, and neutrophils don't know antigen from, uh, from chopped liver. So what we think is happening is that, uh, that, that non-antigen genes are mainly under purifying selection, as in most organisms, that there's not much advantage to escaping if you're a T cell antigen, that there is uh, strong selection for escape in the epitopes, uh, epitope regions of antibody antigens, and then these, which are also surface proteins generally, and then whether this elevation uh, in the non-epitope region is, a, is a, due to linkage or due to other host adaptation, we don't really know. Uh, I should say that the, that the characterization of the T cell antigens in here was the best that's available. It was a, an assay developed by Genosha, which is a company that develops T cell based uh, uh, vaccines. Uh, so it was, it was a, uh, a process to screen for antigenic reactivity uh, in human cells, but it is not 100% sure that that is an effective screen. And so I think another possible explanation uh, that should be considered is that the, that the classification was not, not, may not have been good enough to see, see what was going on in T cell antigens. But if we believe the classification, that's uh, certainly the, the best interpretation. So changing is one way to, uh, to uh, changing an antigen is one way to escape immunity. Getting rid of it might be, or not having it in the first place might be another, and that's exactly what we used in the, in the artificial system of the, of the ovalbumin uh, mice, immunized mice. Um, and in pneumococcus, there are, uh, there's quite a bimodal distribution of gene frequency uh, so there are a lot of genes that are in every pneumococcus, that's the core genome. There are a lot that are in almost every pneumococcus, and then there's this large in-between, uh, and then a lot of uh, genes or COGS that are, uh, that are almost unique. Um, so we were curious about these, these uh, in-between genes and whether there's some uh, sort of balancing selection uh, going on where that gene is performing some useful function that's not essential. And so if it's an immune target, it should be present more in naive hosts who don't have an immune response to it, and less in more experienced or older hosts um, who do. So the idea is, again, that there's this trade-off between function of an antigen uh, for the bug and vulnerability to immunity. And uh, in this study, we don't have any actual measurements of immunity, so we're using as a proxy for it being naive, uh, being young. Uh, in life, that's only a partial proxy, so it's probably only a partial proxy for the immune system, too. Um, but what we found was that there are a, a handful of genes um, that are thought to be antigen-associated. This is a gene of the pilus, which is a surface, surface uh, complex on the, on the outside of the cell. Um, this is uh, zinc metalloprotease, a particular allele of zinc metalloprotease, um, uh, which is uh, also on the surface. Um, this is a, a third protein, and this is uh, MEF. This is actually the drug resistance for one of the two types of drug resistance for macrolides. 
Uh, and all of these tend to be more present in younger hosts than in older hosts. Um, and so these were the four that were significantly, uh, that showed a significant trend in their age distribution uh, after correcting for multiple comparisons. Um, and so what we're now doing is trying to validate that uh, in an independent set uh, and see if the same alleles, I mean, same genes come up. But it's suggestive of the idea that if you're gonna colonize a six month old, uh, it's probably good to have this because it helps you stick. Uh, but if you're gonna colonize uh, a four year old, you'd probably be better off without it because you're uh, exposing more immune targets. So, at the moment, uh, this is sort of what we think we know about these different categories of immunity uh, and diversifying selection, that, that for the capsule, uh, there's selection to diversify by anti-capsular antibody, but that the antiphagocytic and other effects of the capsules are different, and there's a purifying selection or directional selection uh, pushing for particular types to be, uh, to be um, more common. And what, the way we resolve this is that the non-specific, non-serotype specific immunity is enough, uh, is compresses the fitness differences, compresses the purifying selection enough so that diversifying selection is able to sort of triumph and provide uh, quite a bit of diversity. On the, on the antibody antigens, what we would like to know, or what we think is, is going on is that there is uh, diversifying selection on many of these antigens from the anti-protein antibodies. And the stuff in red is really what we're up to right now in the lab or about to be up to in the lab. We don't really know that there's evidence that this antibody to proteins is protective. It's been very hard to, to design uh, protein-based vaccines, uh, suggesting that it may not be as protective as other types of antibody. We also don't know whether what the function of some of these, uh, these these surface proteins is, and in particular, we don't know whether the common ones do their function better than the rare ones, which is a prediction of this, of this hypothesis. Um, and we also don't know uh, whether there's, uh, and we also observe this age structuring in diversity, uh, sorry, age structuring in the presence and absence of some of these, but not yet in diversity. So this is what we're working on now. And the T cell antigen is, as I said, we think the diversifying selection is weak. So I think this also has something to do with public health. Um, basically because almost all the new vaccines against this organism involve proteins. Some of them involve cellular immunity. And so trying to understand the replacement phenomena uh, depends on understanding, again, what is the basis of this kind of, of uh, uh, diversity that we observe. Um, so if you have a model that can't predict the present, it probably doesn't deserve trust to predict the future. Uh, and so that's why we're trying to understand uh, at least semi-quantitatively what's going on. So for the last uh, couple of minutes, I wanna mention uh, a project that's uh, literally hot off the presses. It should be uh, published in a few days, I think, um, which is, using diversity to uh, facilitate gene discovery. Um, so I showed you this picture uh, a few minutes ago. This was our competition experiment that was robust to everything we could do. We repeated it many, many times, not because we were trying to find uh, an exception, but because we uh, wanted to do it under many, many conditions. And it kept coming up the same way. And uh, one day, 19F became a complete loser. And not only that, it became a complete repeatable loser. So if we took that stock, uh, that 19F was unable to um, uh, compete with the other, other strains. And fortunately, we had some of the old stock left over and confirmed that, that it really had changed uh, in its phenotype. So uh, we, tested this in various ways and uh, compared the old stock to the new stock and found that uh, there was something that had happened during passage on, on various, uh, differed in various phenotypes. 
like which are these are the two phenotypes I showed you before that differ between serotypes. And this, so that's what we were trying to study was serotype differences. And we had this annoying difference uh, between two stocks of the same strain, supposedly. So fortunately, we had a, an extra lane in a, in a um, sequencing run that was being done here on our, on our uh, multiple, on our population genomics project. So we added these two strains and sequenced them. And it turns out that there were five SNPs uh, se separating these two stocks. Uh, a warning to all of us who think that we have the same strain over and over again. We don't. Um, but this time we, we suffered for it a bit. Um, so we found that there were these five SNPs uh, in five different, uh, four different genes in an intergenic region. And so the natural thing to do would have been to try to do genetics on all five of those loci, uh, but I have a principle that I call strategic laziness that I try to teach people in the lab that if you can, uh, if you can find ways to do the most likely to succeed experiment first, don't do the controls until you know you have to. Um, and so we tried to elaborate that idea um, as something that other people could use for, for other uh, questions in a sort of uh, procedure like this. So you notice a phenotypic difference between two strains and you find uh, by whole genome sequencing that, we, that there are some uh, SNPs that differ between those strains or they could be, doesn't have to be SNPs, some genetic differences between them. So then because we had this big collection of isolates from Massachusetts, we asked in that collection for pairs of isolates that were matched for serotype, and that's because that controls the phenotype. We, we knew that's a, a big effect on the phenotype we're interested in. They were otherwise closely related, but differed as much as possible at those sequences, uh, at the sequence of those five target genes. So we looked into the natural diversity uh, for the sequence of those target genes to be different in otherwise closely related isolates. Then we have this low-cost assay, which is, uh, which is the escape from phagocytosis in vitro, which we could perform on, on those isolate pairs uh, that were uh, selected from the, natural, from the natural diversity. And then when we saw a phenotypic difference of the sort that we thought might be indicative uh, of, of the same thing that was going on in the, in the isolates we cared about, which were our lab isolates, we hypothesized that that was a likely causal gene and then did proper genetics to confirm it. So you only do the costly step, at least you first do the costly step, on those that have been screened uh, to find this. So we're only getting a, this was a five, potentially five-fold increase in efficiency, but five, uh, five is still a large number and in poten potentially one could do more if there were more differences. So we took pairs uh, from around this uh, tree uh, that were closely related, serotype matched, and very different at the loci of choice. And we performed the low-cost uh, assay, the escape from phagocytosis, on those pairs. And what we found was that the only pair that had a difference in that low-cost assay was the one that differed at SP1645, uh, an ABC, uh, sorry, a, a GTP pyrophosphokinase uh, in the stringent response pathway. <clears throat> and then we did proper genetics where we switched the uh, alleles in our strains of interest. We took the strains that in the lab had behaved differently. We switched the alleles at that locus only um, and competed them against each other uh, in the mouse uh, and also did the, the in vitro assay and found that, um, in fact, switching the alleles switched the phenotype, showing that that was a causal, that that locus was causal. And then I think the, what's nice about this is actually an idea Bill Hanage suggested uh, as the next step, which is if this, uh, if this gene has an effect on competitive ability in, vitro, in vivo um, and ability to escape neutrophils, maybe it's something about the whole pathway and maybe we can discover more genes. Uh, it was a, a nice hypothesis which was partially confirmed and not completely. Um, so then we went around, went, went back and did this again and said, let's do this for every gene in the same pathway. So we'll look for uh, pairs with the same serotype in the natural diversity, low overall genetic distance, and high genetic distance at these candidate loci that are in that same pathway. 
and then again look for uh, to see whether those differ. Um, and to the, the short answer is that we did find strains that uh, differed at one locus, uh, the, the 1099 locus, 1097 locus, <coughs> and uh, in, our, in our low cost assay, uh, which is survival from surface phagocytosis, we did the genetics to switch the alleles in those strains and uh, found that the, the phenotype switched. So we found a causal gene for, uh, for um, in the natural diversity, where natural diversity affects ability to survive phagocytes. Uh, it also affected growth rate. It did not affect uh, other, uh, it did not affect uh, in vitro, in vivo competition. So we, the, in this case, the cheap assay, uh, the cheap phenotype was uh, more, um, was not completely indicative of the full phenotype. So to conclude, um, I hope this excursion uh, into somewhat different topics from what much of the conference will be about has been uh, relevant. And the reason I think it's relevant is that it shows that there's some interplay between surveillance, uh, which is a public health activity, mechanistic biology, transmission modeling, and population genomics, which is uh, what many, virtually everyone here likes to do. And the, the relationships are, many, are several. It's, one is an exploitative relationship that, that we, surveillance is one of the few ways that we get representative strain collections um, and collections with data uh, attached to them about the host, like age in this case. So we, we couldn't have done this without a surveillance uh, basis. So that's why how we use surveillance uh, to, to ask mechanistic questions. But I think it also provides some value to surveillance by showing the value of phenotyping uh, isolates um, and, and sequencing them and phenotyping and sequencing the same isolates so that you can ask questions uh, within a, a representative collection about the relationship and then enhancing surveillance uh, to, to su suggest what we should be looking for. So this is the list of collaborators. Uh, I want to highlight Rick Malley, uh, who's sitting there with me on a camel, um, uh, from Children's Hospital, with whom almost all of this work, uh, especially the laboratory, the experimental part, was done uh, as an a even e equal collaboration. Um, uh, also, people from the, the Sanger, Stee, and, and Julian, have been uh, central to getting the, the sequencing projects uh, and their interpretation done. Nick Croucher, who many of you know, who used to be here uh, and then came to us and now is at Imperial. Uh, Bill Hanage um, and others who I highlighted along the way. And John Finkelstein, who, who had the bright idea to start doing surveillance for carriage in Massachusetts many years ago. ago. I'll stop there. <coughs> I wanted to ask you about those puny strains that have no right to exist. Uh, it, I have kind of two questions that might be related. The first is, is it possible that they are uh, inhabiting some kind of functional niche that is different from the other strains and that could explain so that they're not really competing and then with the others? And then the other question is, in, in the natural host, uh, is what can you tell us about the duration of carriage? of different strains. How does it vary by strain, and how does it vary by age, for example? Okay. Um, so I shouldn't have unplugged so fast. Where did that go? Um, uh, okay, so to answer the first question, um, the, the lousy strains certainly do have some different properties uh, from, the, from the good strains um, and the, the serotypes. And it's possible, including much shorter duration, and it's, people have hypothesized that they're sort of the, the, weedy, species, the weedy serotypes that, that go from environment to environment, host to host, uh, very quickly and, um, and uh, somehow rely on their virulence more, maybe, or something. Um, whether that means they don't compete is another question, though, because they are still in the same, at least macro niche, whether the nasopharynx is a collection of 100 different things that we don't know about, uh, I don't know. When we, to the extent we can tell, everything competes with everything. 
uh, but our strength of evidence for that is much greater for the common serotypes, obviously, because we can measure it more precisely. Um, so I would say it's, it's, we can't absolutely exclude that, but I don't think, I don't think there's clear evidence uh, for that, uh, for that hypothesis that there's a difference in uh, what niche they're occupying. Um, to answer your question um, about, about duration of carriage, so this is what we know, and it only is based on serotype. Um, uh, so, so there may be other factors, but serotype is a very, very large portion of the, of the effect. Um, this is the, precisely speaking, this is the rate at which we inferred that they would have been cleared by host immunity if they weren't replaced by another strain. So this was a longitudinal, very frequent follow-up in Kenya. Um, and uh, so this is how long they would have stuck around had they not been displaced by other strains. They also get displaced by other strains, so it was a statistical separation of those two processes. Um, uh, and so uh, what you can see is that if you're in Kenya, if you're three and a half years old, uh, you clear basically everybody in about 30 days on average, and, and of course there's variation around that. If you are a, an infant, you clear the lousy strain, lousier strains in maybe something close to 30 days. Uh, some of, we only have age stratified data on the more common strains. But you clear pretty quickly the lousier strains, and you uh, clear much more slowly uh, and much more variably the, uh, the more common serotypes. So when I say lousy, if you don't believe in using language like that in, in scientific talks, just say, think common uh, or uncommon, uncommon. Um, yeah. Mark, I'm wondering whether there's um, a way in which you're also modeling that there could be selection for the pan genome. Whether, because you're talking about it, sort of the selection strain by strain, but then since you have the core genome and you have all of this flexible genome, whether there may be some way in which the community is select is being selected. Um, so, uh, I, I tend to be resistant to the idea of communities uh, being of genes being selected because I don't understand the mechanism really. I don't. I, I don't know either. But I mean, you know, just this idea that, you know, we have previous. I mean, there is, if there is this diversity, whether strains are being viewed. All, always in isolation, or whether there is some way, and maybe it's through other, you know, uh, epistatic things that are being carried on the genome, that there is some way, and, and maybe this is not it, because if, if you're saying these are all being cleared, then maybe the community is not stabilized, but there is some strep pneumo community. Right. Um, when they are cleared, they, they tend to be cleared together, is our is what we learned from, from this experiment, and you couldn't have guessed that from, from how I uh, described it, but, but one of the things that this experiment showed is that, that when the strains get, when the immune response kicks in and the two strains get cleared, they tend to get cleared together. Okay. Um, okay. But, uh, but just briefly to answer your other question, I think the, uh, I get nervous with the idea of, of as I said, of selection on the community, but I think this, this whole question that we're trying to understand um, is a way in which the commonness of a, of a, of a gene, of an, uh, of a gene, say the pilus, which is in about 25% of strains, if it gets too common, it produces more immunity and becomes disadvantageous. So there is some way in which one strain knows what other strain have, strains have. So that, I think, really does happen, but we should talk more about what, what else might be going on. That's very interesting. Thanks very much, Mark. Thank you. Um, thank you.